the FBI warned in open testimony in the House of Representatives in September 2004, over seven years ago, when there was plenty of time to stop it, that there was an epidemic of mortgage fraud and predicted that it would cause a financial crisis if it were not stopped. Those are their, their words. It was picked up, as I say, in the national media. Now we've seen this before in the savings and loan crisis. This NICFR acronym stands for the National Commission that looked into the causes of the savings and loan crisis. And I'm quoting from the official report. The typical large savings and loan failure grew at an extremely rapid rate, achieving high concentrations of assets in risky ventures. Every accounting trick available was used. Evidence of fraud was invariably present as was the ability of the operators to milk the organization by which they mean loot it through executive compensation. At the typical large failure, fraud was invariably present. Two of the best economists in the world looked into this, and they published an article in 1993, and the title of it pretty much says it all. Looting the economic underworld of bankruptcy for profit. Plunder by Bastiat. Looting is when the CEO loots the, his corporation. The corporation fails, that's a bankruptcy, but he walks away wealthy. We seen any of that? All the time. And the regulators saw this in the savings and loan crisis and began cracking down promptly. This is what Akerlof and Romer said. In fact, they made this the concluding paragraph to their article in order to emphasize it. Neither the public nor economists foresaw that safe and loan deregulation of the 1980s was bound to produce looting. Nor, unaware of the concept, could they have known how serious it would be. Thus, the regulators in the field who understood what was happening from the beginning found lukewarm support at best for their cause. They're being polite. We found total opposition. Now we know better. If we learn from experience, history need not repeat itself. So we knew what caused it. We had an early warning from the FBI in September 2004, and this is what happened instead. This should be the most infamous picture out of the current crisis. This individual is holding a chainsaw, which is why we call him Chainsaw Gilleran. He was the head of the Office of Thrift Supervision, which was supposed to regulate IndyMac, Countrywide, Washington Mutual, the three biggest makers of insured institutions who made liar's loans. He's standing next to the three leading bank lobbyists in America, and the guy who will be his successor. They're all holding pruning shears, the big kind that you could chop off somebody's wrist with. <laughs> and they are poised and posed over a pile of federal regulation. And if that's too subtle, in the color version you can tell they're tied up in red, red tape. And they were so proud of this that they put it in the 2003 <laughs> annual report of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And this, of course, is designed to send a message. And the message is, we, the anti-regulators, are happy to be seen publicly working with the industry to destroy regulation. And we're not going to be careful about it. We're going to take a chainsaw to it. Well, mission accomplished, boys. And you saw how much it cost because they did nothing. The same agency that cracked down in the savings and loan debacle, that knew exactly how to prevent these problems, that had a proven system for doing so, this is what the difference is between deregulation and desupervision. You can have all the rules in place you want, 
You put Chainsaw Jill Gillerin in charge of an agency, none of the rules will get enforced. And everybody knew that. So, in the savings and loan debacle, which <laughs> I say here was 40 times worse, just the losses in the household sector in this crisis, according to the National Commission that investigated the causes, just the household sector, are $11 trillion. A trillion is a thousand billion. The savings and loan crisis cost 150 billion. So if you just took the household sector losses, and there are far more losses, it's actually 70 times larger than the savings and loan crisis. In the savings and loan crisis, our agency, that Office of Thrift Supervision, before the chainsaw guy arrived, made well over 10,000 criminal referrals produced over a thousand felony convictions in cases designated as major, and indeed that understates the degree because we prioritized the absolute worst five to six hundred, and we prosecuted virtually all of them. We got a 90% conviction rate. <laughs> this is the CEOs on trial, so they spend money like water and they hire the best criminal lawyers in the world to defend themselves. It can be done, but you, it's hard. And you need systems, and you've got to work cooperatively. So, what did the same agency, the Office of Thrift Supervision, do in this crisis where, remember, there was an epidemic of fraud identified as early as 2004. They made a grand total of zero criminal referrals. You can do the math. <laughs> um, they weren't about to make referrals. The concept that people who wore nice suits could be criminals, of course they can't. They are the one percent. In fact, they're the one tenth. In fact, they're the one thousandth of one percent. They must be good people. As at its peak, we had a thousand FBI agents working savings and loan cases alone. As recently as fiscal year 2007, we had a grand total of 120 FBI agents. One eighth as many agents for a crisis 70 times, actually much larger than 70 times greater. There were well over a million cases a year of mortgage fraud. What are 120 agents going to do if they're assigned to look at a, hundred, a million a year? This is like going to San Diego, which seems a very nice idea as the weather gets colder, uh, going to the beach and throwing handfuls of beach sand into the ocean and wondering when you can walk to Hawaii. It ain't ever going to happen. Every year, you're a million cases farther behind. You have to go at the crooks, the crooks in the C-suite, and that is what they absolutely refused to do because they had no criminal referrals. And there are no police on elite white-collar criminals. Here's a thought experiment. What if you had say in 2001, August, called up the Houston Police Department and said, I think some really bad things are happening in Enron. Can you look into that for me? Right? We have roughly a million cops. How many of them look for elite white collar criminals? Zero. Does the FBI patrol a beat? No, they're in offices in various places. The only folks who are there, who can be there, are the regulatory cops in the beat. Under Chainsaw Gillerin, you think there were any regulatory cops in the beat? No. All of them have been pulled. Where are all the cops now? Doing pepper spray. <laughs> right? no, we, we won't go after the real criminals, 
but we'll go after peaceful protesters. And in New York alone, they had roughly a thousand police assigned in the big crackdown day. Right? Eight times as many FBI agents as we put. Looking at the little people, never at the big people in this crisis. And as a result, we have no convictions of anybody senior in Wall Street. We don't have, I mean, the only conviction we have is somebody doing coke, you know, type of thing, and they weren't even terribly senior. The FBI, to their credit, realized this was a disaster, realized it couldn't possibly work, that you, every year you are more than a million cases more farther behind. And so they went to the Justice Department and they said, we have to change the way we're doing this. We have to have a national task force that prioritizes and that we have to go after the major criminal lenders. At which point, Attorney General McCasey, uh, this was under President Bush, uh, but don't worry, I have no good things to say about his successor under uh, President Obama, uh, <coughs> said he refused to create a national task force and said, Famously, this is simply white-collar street crime. It's just all trivial stuff. We can't be bothered to look at any of the big stuff.